I love talking about praying. Um, I love talking about giving. I love, love talking about fasting, don't you? And I mean, uh, but you know what? When I start talking about where my treasure is, that gets me excited. And so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. But first of all, I want to uh, share with you a little story about the Florida State University football coach. Anybody know who that coach is or who that coach used to be? Bobby, Bobby Bowden, that's right. Well, Bobby Bowden used to inspire his teams using parables. Well, one parable that Coach Bowden told was when he was playing college baseball, he had never hit a home run. And then finally one day, crack, out of the park, that ball went. So young Bobby Bowden, he rounds first base. And you look over the third base coach, and the third base coach is just waving him on. He goes by second base and halfway to third, and the coach was still waving it on. Come on home, boy. And finally he got home, and he arrived safely, of course. He had had his first home run. He was so excited. All of his friends were slapping him on the back and giving him high fives. I mean, it was so an awesome, awesome day. And then the pitcher took the ball and threw it to first base, and the umpire called him out. Why? He forgot to step on first base. Coach said, if you don't take care of first base, it don't matter what else you do. <laughs> Likewise, if you don't honor the Lord first, it don't matter what else you do. So I'm thankful that you're here tonight and you're honoring the Lord first because it matters what else you do. In today's section of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is going to stress the importance of of stepping on first base. Stepping on first base, making first things first before you go on to the other bases. In other words, Jesus is going to be dealing with priorities. He's going to be dealing with what our focus should be. You know, something always has to be first. Something is always first in our lives. Nod your head if you agree. Something is always first in our lives. God's challenge for you today is that he be first in your life and that you invest in heavenly treasures. If you would, turn with me in the scriptures to Matthew chapter 6 and let's read just a few short verses today beginning in verse 19. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 19, all the words of the Lord Jesus. And he says... Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Many Christians are not victorious in their Christian growth. Many are not victorious in their Christian service because they don't treasure the things of God. The things of God seem to take a back seat. They work further on down their priority list. They don't treasure Christian growth. They don't treasure Christian service. Therefore, those things aren't a priority. They're not a focus of their life. Going to church ain't important. Praying seems to be a waste of time. Bible reading is considered immaterial. Telling others about Jesus is kind of embarrassing. And giving to the work of God is out of the question. Their lives are consumed with accumulating things. And these attitudes are basically selfish greed. And they exist today, but they also existed in the days of our Lord Jesus Christ. So for this reason, the Lord Jesus gives us, first of all, a caution, a caution about covetousness. We need to know uh, that it is God's will that we not be covetous. Jesus tells us first what not to do concerning the treasures in our life. He says, do not Lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. That's, that's a pretty uh, direct order from headquarters, amen? Do not lay up for yourselves 
treasures on earth. What's all that about? Well, first of all, let's look at what this does not mean, okay? First of all, this accumulating or uh, building up, laying up treasures on earth is not Jesus condemning people that are wealthy. It does not condemn people that are wealthy. Abraham was filthy rich. Job was very, very wealthy, very wealthy men, uh, and they worked hard. They had honest work. They put in all their lives working toward those things, and they used their wealth rightly. So this doesn't mean uh, that he's condemning wealthy people. Uh, it also doesn't mean that we're not to earn a living and provide for our families. Uh, Proverbs 14, 23, Solomon wrote, that he who tills the land will have plenty of bread, but he who follows idleness will have plenty, sure enough, will have poverty, sure enough. Amen? That's Brother Bill's little addition there. You like that? We'll have poverty, sure enough. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, if anyone shall not work, neither shall he. Well, we know that one, don't we? That one strikes me home. I'm going to work. I'm going to eat. Amen? <laughs> then Paul wrote to Timothy, and he said, but if anyone doesn't provide for his own, and especially those of his own household, then he is denied the faith. And get this, he's worse than an unbeliever. So Jesus is not talking about, hey, you don't have to support your family. You don't have to provide for your family. Uh, so what does, Je what does Jesus mean in this verse? Well, you need to examine the original Bible word or for that phrase, lay up. What does lay up mean? Um, as I was studying that definition, uh, I got a picture of a, uh, a casino. Somebody sitting at a blackjack table who's winning a lot of money. What do they do with their chips? Stack them up right in front of them, right? Got all these chips, right? They're accumulating all this wealth. That's what laying up means. It suggests stacking up your wealth. It means laying out horizontally for you to see and for everybody else to see. Like one might stack coins. Uh, it suggests stockpiling. It suggests hoarding wealth. Uh, it pictures wealth that's not being used. It's just being stashed for me. Right? It's not being used for any kingdom work. It's really just wasting away. So uh, it describes a kind of behavior that we find in Luke chapter 12 as the rich man was wasting the life, the abilities, and the blessings that God had given him. Turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 12, and let's take a little look at that real quick. Just a few short verses. Uh, it's incredible. I just shared this last Wednesday, but um, it sure does fit this one as well. Luke chapter 12, and I'm going to begin in verse 16. Everybody with? All right. Verse 16, Luke chapter 12. Then Jesus spoke a parable to his disciples, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build a greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So as we think about this laying up, um, and we think about what does Jesus mean about this laying up, um, we need to think about, is it being used for earthly hoarding or some kind of heavenly good? All right. Uh, what does he mean when he uses the word treasure? Uh, treasure could mean a whole number of things. Uh, could it mean money? It could mean money. Could it mean things that you've accumulated? It could mean things. Uh, could, it, could you treasure people? Certainly you can treasure people. But what the Lord means here is not only money for or material goods, um, but whatever one person eagerly strives for. That's his treasure. That which he or she most dreads to lose. 
What is a treasure? Whatever you think will bless you the most if you have it. What is your treasure? If you don't have it, will you be dissatisfied and miserable? That's a treasure. Now, certainly this is a warning to the rich, but it's not for the wealthy only. It doesn't say, do not do not lay up your, for yourselves money on earth. Okay? It says treasures. And treasures could be any number of things. In Jesus' day, it included clothes. That was a big sign of wealth in Jesus' day. It include, included the change of outer garments, the cloaks and whatnot. Uh, it included gold and silver. It included precious gems. It included wine. It included land. It included salt. It included oil. If you had all these things, those were treasures in the day of Christ. It meant an abundance of anything. Abundance of anything that displayed the comforts of life. What Jesus has in mind is people who get their entire satisfaction from things. They get their entire satisfaction from things that belong to this world only. When I look through that list I just shared with you, clothes, gold, silver, gems, wine, land, salt, and oil, you ain't taking none of that with you. Amen? None of that's going with you. He's concerned about selfishness and misplaced values. He's concerned about a coveting spirit. That's a problem. Uh, that's also something we call greed. So even if you set your mind on uh, a great accumulation of great wealth, there's something else that just might be a sinful treasure for you. For example, a home could be a sinful treasure if it's the most important thing in your life. Amen? A family could be. If you place your family and nurturing your family above worshiping God, you selected your family as being your treasure. Why? Because it's more important to you than God. Time. Now this is going to get personal. This will get in your grill right here. Time can be a treasure. Time can be something that people treasure. Uh, make sure you're giving God your time. Make sure you're giving him your time, your valuable time. Take time to pray. Take time to read the scriptures. Take time to tell others about Christ. Amen? Take time to worship. Give some of that precious time to God. Because it is a treasure. And God deserves that treasure. The earthly time you use for Christ won't be anything compared to the eternal time you'll have with Christ. I read an illustration about uh, a story that Harold Fickett wrote about this very, very wealthy businessman. This man was on his deathbed and... As he was, he was filled with deep remorse. When his pastor came to his house and called on him, um, that man began to open his heart and he shared this burden that he had that was so heavy. Uh, he said that 10 years before he got to sick, he had been given an opportunity. We talked about opportunities this morning, didn't we? He'd been given an opportunity to teach a Sunday school class of nine-year-old boys. First impulse when you hear teaching a Sunday school class to nine-year-old boys is what? Not for me, right? Well, that's exactly what he said. He had this opportunity, and he didn't have the time, and so he declined the offer. Now, deeply conscious that his life was nearing its end, this man confessed to his pastor that the most painful regret that he had was that he missed such a golden opportunity to serve the Lord. Most of all, more than anything else in this man's life, he regretted not investing his life in the lives of those nine-year-old children. And he began to estimate that probably about a hundred children would have come through that Sunday school class over the course of that 10 years. He said, all my investments, all my stocks and all my bonds, all my wealth will stay behind. 
Oh, what a fool I've been. Are you making a difference with your life? Time is a treasure. Where are you giving that treasure? Are you laying it up for earthly treasures? Or as we're going to learn here in a moment, are you laying it up for heavenly treasures? Where is your treasure? After he talked about having a caution towards covetousness, Jesus moves on to the corruption of the earthly treasure. Let's read the first part of, or the second part of verse 19. Uh, Do not lay for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. He says, don't lay up earthly treasures. Why? Because they can spoil. They can spoil or they can get stolen. In his day, uh, in Jesus' day when he was on earth, wealth was measured in a large part by clothing. You wouldn't think this, but what the rich folks did is they had so much gold, they would weave gold in their clothes. And it wasn't only so that they could look pretty, but they needed somewhere to store it. So they wove it into their clothes. But you know what? Even the rich couldn't protect their sweat-drenched clothes from moths, could they? Grain was also considered a treasure. But you and I know that grain can ruin, grain can spoil. That word translated rust there in verse 9, where moth and rust destroy Rust is not just about metal in this context. Rust in the original scriptures, in the original language, means to be devoured or eaten. So it refers not only to corroding metals, it also refers to the destruction of grain uh, by rats, mice, mildew, worms, insects, right? Uh, rust is more than just the metals. Uh, treasure could also be stolen by thieves. You have to remember, they didn't have housing like we have now. They had housing with straw and mud walls. It was pretty easy uh, to go in and just dig through the straw and the mud if you wanted to get into somebody's treasures, right? So what, that's why people began to bury their treasures in the yard. Amen? Many of y'all do the same thing, don't you? <laughs> Ain't no telling how many coffee cans are in this house. Amen? <laughs> but uh, that's what they did. Instead of keeping it in their mud huts, they went and buried it in the yard. That way nobody knew them. So moths and rust and thieves destroy treasure, the scripture says there in verse 19, where moths and rust destroy or corrupt. That original word there for destroy uh, means to snatch out of you. It means to vanish away or destroy or consume. It means you ain't got it no more. She gone, amen? However, the possessions that are wisely used, the possessions that are lovingly and willingly and generously used for kingdom purposes, guess what? They don't ever corrupt. They don't ever get destroyed. They last forever and ever. Their value is eternal. They're never corrupted. So we've got to be careful. We've got to be careful about treasuring money or the things that money buys to the point where the Lord is neglected or the Lord is rejected in this life. You may have heard this before, that money can buy a bed, but it can't buy sleep. You've heard that money will buy books, but it won't buy brains. That's a testimony, amen. <laughs> money will buy food, but it won't buy an appetite. Money will buy a house, but it can't buy a home. Money will buy medicine, but it won't buy health. Money can buy luxuries, but cannot buy culture. Money can buy amusements, but it can't buy happiness. Money can buy religion, but it can't buy salvation. Wow. So Jesus warns that earthly treasure is going to be destroyed. Why would you want that to be your priority? Why would that be your number one focus if it's not going to last forever? You can't take it with you. You remember what Job said? Job said, naked I came out of my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave, the Lord taken away. Blessed is the name of the Lord. And then I think that, that Paul was probably reading Job when he wrote this to Timothy, saying, we have brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. 
Why would you want to place your, your focus on something that you're not taking with you? Now let's hear the command about our treasures. Let's read verse 20. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. So Jesus has told us what not to do. That's important. Now he gives us some positive instruction, and he tells us what we should do. If you're going to lay up for treasures, Jesus says, why not lay them up in heaven? Lay them up where they're going to last forever. Lay them up where the value is magnified. Lay them up there. Paul said it great. He said, set your affection on things up there above, not things that are on the earth. So what does it mean to lay up treasures in heaven? What is Jesus talking about here? It means you use everything you got for the glory of God. It brings fresh understanding to that passage in Hebrews that says, whatever we do that's not from faith is sin. Right? So use everything that we do, everything that we have, use it for the glory of God. It means to hold on loosely, open-handed, hold on loosely when it comes to material things of this world. It also means measuring our lives by kingdom riches, not by earthly riches. Heavenly treasures, think about it, they never diminish in value. Heavenly treasures are permanent. They're lasting. They're satisfying. Their luster will never decrease. Their glory will never be gone. Their joy will never cease. The time will never detract from the brilliance of heavenly treasure. But it's sad that a lot of Christians seem to be content with a very small amount of heavenly treasure. They prefer to hold on to those skimpy spiritual rations that earthly treasures bring. They want to cut out Bible preaching and Bible teaching so they can increase their playtime. They want to decrease their giving instead of looking for ways to increase their giving. So how do we invest in heavenly treasures? Well, here are a few ways. Obviously, sacrificial giving to the Lord is a spiritual investment. Supplication or intercessory prayer, time spent on your knees for other people, is a spiritual investment. Serving the Lord Jesus in any capacity is a spiritual investment. An eternal investment, steadfastness or faithfulness to the Lord is a great investment. Persevering, keeping, fighting the good fight is a great investment. Sharing the good news of Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection with non-believers is a huge spiritual investment. And even suffering, suffering for Jesus' sake, is a significant spiritual investment. Friends, look, please remember this. We're all going to be held accountable. We're all going to be held in account when it comes to what we invested in. We're going to have to answer for it. The Bible says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So the Lord is going to hold the final tabulation sheet and he's going to analyze our investments. Were you satisfied with the skimpy earthly investments or did you pursue those heavenly treasure and investments? Finally, I want you to see the companion of your treasure. Verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart is will be also. Your heart is going to shadow your treasure. Your heart is going to focus on that which you think is important. Your heart is going to focus on that which you think is valuable. 
If you think that spiritual ministry is important and valuable, then guess what? You're going to put your whole heart into it. On the other hand, if you feel like that gaining a bunch of money is very important, and that's where all your value comes from, guess where your heart's going to be? You're going to pour it out into trying to make more and more money. The thing that a person values the most is what's going to occupy the center of his or her heart. What do you value? What's number one on your list? I hope God or the Lord Jesus or living a Holy Spirit-led life is on the top of your list. You know, if honor and recognition are your treasures, then you're probably going to be kind of preoccupied with ambition. If money is your treasure, you're probably going to struggle with covetousness and greed. Because your heart shadows where your values are. On the other hand, if you value eternal riches the most, you're going to pursue spiritual matters. It's a law that's just as strong as the law of gravity. Your heart follows where you pursue. So where are your treasures? You know, some people don't know. They don't know where the treasure is. So maybe these questions will help you. If you don't know where your treasure is, uh, you answer these questions personally and, and see if you can determine where your treasure is. Number one, what occupies your thoughts when you have nothing else to do? When you're just daydreaming, what are you daydreaming about? Your investments, your portfolio, your position, some person that's consuming all of your time. If so, those are your treasures, and that's where your heart really is. Number two, what do you fret about the most? You worry about money all the time? It's probably where your treasure is. You worried about the next bigger and better home? That's probably where your treasure is. Are you worried about, my goodness, what am I going to wear? That's probably where your treasure is. Number three, apart from loved ones, what or whom do you most dread losing? Number four. This is a big one. What are the things that you use to measure other people? That's a very, very revealing mirror. Because... We measure the worth in other people by what we treasure. Did y'all get that? We measure the worth in other people by what we treasure. You measure others by what they wear? You measure others by their education level or by their homes, by their athletic abilities, by their success in the business world? If so, then you know where your treasure is. Lastly, what is it that you know you cannot be happy without? What is it that you can't be happy without? I'd love to hear a resounding, I can't live without Jesus. Amen? Because that would mean that's where your treasure is. If that's not the answer to your question, I want to challenge you to work towards that end. To make him your priority. So where exactly is your treasure? Only you can honestly answer those questions. That's not my business. That's not my job to answer those questions for you. But I will leave you with one quote from Charles Spurgeon tonight. And that is this. A person's heart only has enough life in it to pursue one object fully. 
What's your object? Where's your treasure? Jesus wants your treasure to be him. Everything else will over, overflow from that relationship. Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for these piercing lessons about priorities and focus. Lord, it just doesn't take much to, to get caught up in the material things of this world. But Lord, it's messages like this. It's scripture passages like this. It's your words like these. Father, that just make us look afresh at where our focus is. Father, let us not just be Christians in word only. Let us be Christians and servants in deeds. Father, let us serve you with all of our heart, with all that we are. Lord, let us treasure our relationship with you. And let everything that we do, say, pray, think, and all the attitudes that we keep, Lord, I pray that you would let those be an outpouring of the treasure that we have in you. Father, help us to stay focused. Lord, don't let us look at the things, the temporary things of this world. But Lord, let us look and, and pursue and lay up the eternal treasures in heaven. Father, I can't speak for my friends today, but I believe I, I know that that's where our heart is right now. It's seeking after you. Lord, I pray now that you would use your servants this week. That great and mighty things would occur as a result of what you do through us. Because you are our priority. You are our treasure. So Lord, here we are. Open-handed. Cleansed of sin. Empty of self. And Lord, prepared to be used. As we go out into our mission fields, whether they be at school, work, wherever they may be outside these walls, let you be glorified, God. Let Jesus be our treasure. And we lift this prayer in his holy name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Y'all be blessed and have a great week. Thank you. Thank you.